What part of Vietnam did your family come from? Both of my parents came from North Vietnam. My mom from Hadong province, uh, pretty well known for uh, silk. And my father came from Hung Yen. Vietnam is divided in 1954 after the French are defeated. Um, there's North Vietnam and then South Vietnam. Uh, North Vietnam generally associated with the communist movement and yes. South Vietnam generally not associated with the communist movement. When did your parents move from North Vietnam to South Vietnam? Uh, it's not uh, very clear and I never talked about it, mm. but uh, I think uh, both my mom and dad uh, came to South, uh, right to Saigon in the late uh, 1940s. So they were following my godfather, who is a Frenchman. Oh. He, he is a very rich, uh, um, he had the corporation that owns all of the movie theaters in all the five Indo-Chinese countries. Oh, wow. Okay, so your parents went to South Vietnam not because after, after the French defeat, there was a large movement of North Vietnamese to the South who did not want to live in a, you know, in a communist system. But your parents, you think, moved well before that in the late 1940s to Saigon. Yes. Oh. To make it more complicated, we found out uh, after he passed away, uh, that uh, he was a member of the Viet Minh, the Viet Minh, um, uh, Vietnam Dong Minh Hoi, which is the uh, League of uh, Allies of Vietnam, created by uh, Ho Chi Minh. Your, your, he, your, your yeah, father was, was, your father was, was a member of the Viet Minh? Yes. Now the Viet Minh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm wondering whether he was trying to avoid the, because after the, um, when I started doing uh, research on the Vietnam War, uh, I found out that uh, Ho Chi Minh started to um, purge the Viet Minh. Before 1954, Viet Minh was a uh, combined communist and uh, nationalist. So maybe he found out uh, something, so he decided to defect to Saigon. Okay, because he, he would have been on the nationalist side, not the communist side? Yes. Okay. Now the Viet Minh, that's the forerunner to the Viet Cong, right? Uh, no. Um, Viet Minh uh, before Dinh Binh Phu was a combined nationalist yeah. and communist. They all have the same goal of uh, defeating the French. Okay. So your father was in favor of defeating the French, um, but it does sound complicated because your godfather was a wealthy Frenchman who owned theaters in Vietnam. It could be the other way. He might have decided uh, to collaborate with the French. And so after that, uh, I was born in 1950, so that, that was my godfather who sent me to uh, the elitist uh, lycée, Lyceum uh, High School in Saigon uh, called uh, uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau. Wow. So everything was French. Um, and then actually we lived in the same house, same condo with my godfather. So you don't know, it sounds like you're, it might be that your father was a nationalist opposed to the French or that your father could have been in favor of the French. And it sounds like you're not sure which. I'm not sure. We never talked about politics. Goodness. Well, that's, yeah, that is, that is very complicated. Well, you, you, got an education in a French school um, and all of the instruction was in French, is that right? Yes, correct, yes. 
So you you get an education in a French school. The name of the school is named after this French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, yes. Growing up, what was your own feeling about the French? Of course, the French are going to be defeated when you're a very young child. But what feelings did you have? You know, the French had gone, but the American presence was not really very strong until we get into the 1960s. So in the, in the second half of the 1950s, what was your opinion about the French and, and the fact that France had been there in Indochina? So even though we attended Jean Jean Rousseau, even though everything we were taught came from the French education system, we were not really uh, political, mm. either active or even, even thinking. Our, so the, I think uh, the goal of the Lycée Jean Rousseau was to form elitist leaders. It is surprising that they never taught us politics. Wow. A lot of history. We learn a lot of history of the world, but no politics. And were the teachers French? They were from France, the teachers? Mo mostly uh, graduates from Sorbonne in Paris. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were raised then to be in the leadership class. This is you're going to an elite school. And the idea is to train the elite of Vietnam. And you do become an officer in the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And we'll, um, we'll hear about that. When, when did the situation in Vietnam, when did that really enter your mind? When did you really realize for the first time that there was, there was a significant problem between North and South? Um. Before 1968, uh, we were aware of the war. The war. We uh, saw um, uh, uh, soldiers from uh, other countries. So we saw a lot of Americans in Saigon, but we never thought that there was a war. We, could, we didn't feel there was a war. Besides, sometimes we have bombardment, um, uh, missiles being thrown at, or the uh, terrorist uh, throwing a grenade, or like the fair. We had a Saigon, like, like a state fair. Yeah. And they rigged the mine to explode uh, civilians. So we, we were aware of that. But we didn't really feel it because we were not the victims. Then, uh, not until I said 1968 was, uh, could be the cutoff line because uh, that was the year of the Tet Offensive. Right. So right away, uh, as the schools were closed, right away we volunteered. I volunteered with, the, with this university students to go um, and uh, help rescue, help uh, clean up uh, houses that were demolished. Wow. And so that was the time when we had the wake up uh, the war, we felt it. And so the Tet Offensive was kind of a, a wake up call for you when you really, when you realized that the, you knew that there was a war, but the Tet Offensive is what really brought the war home to you. In that and there, there was another situation. Um, one of the boys who lived in the condo uh, building. Uh, it's still the condo is now still there. Wow. It's just kitty corner from the nah, the uh, opera house in Saigon. Oh, so, near the near the cathedral and uh, yes, the cathedral is uh, a little bit north, yeah. more north of the, on Dudo Street. Right. Yeah. So one of the boys uh, in the condo building was uh, killed uh, at war. He was uh, with the probably the first uh, infantry division of the uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam. 
So his uh, body was uh, sent back to his parents and there was a funeral in the building and it, it, there's no way to not see it. So whenever we come down that we had to go pass by his coffin. And so that was probably in 1964 or 65, very early okay. before the war yeah. expected. Yes. Now, so you you finished your um, your secondary education, and then you went to university, right? In yes, in Saigon, and and what did you study at the university? I attended uh, two universities. There's a University of Saigon um, in science, um, math, chemistry, mineral, and organic physics. Wow. And at the same time, I went to a Buddhist university for English education. Wow. So you're attending two different universities then at the same time? Yes. Wow. And what was your goal? My uh, ultimate goal was uh, to pass the exam, the entrance exam into medical school either that or uh, pharmacy or dental school. And I failed all of the, those exams. The only exam that I passed was the, for the Buddhist uh, university, University of Van Han mm. in Saigon. Is one of the reasons, was it, was the war partly responsible for you um, not succeeding in these exams? Was the war taking your energy and your time? Is that one of the problems that you had at that time? There, there were many reasons. Uh, the, the main reason was that uh, since I went to French school, I, I know more French uh, vocabulary and terminology. And so when I took the exam, I chose uh, French. And we'll find out later that there is a, a, a lot of competition between those who graduated from French school, French university, versus those who graduated from Vietnamese or university or American in the government, even in the Thieu um, presidency. So when did you complete your university studies? So I failed uh, those uh, medical schools, but I passed. So I started uh, my education in uh, English education, and that gives me uh, the uh, benefit of being uh, deferred from being drafted. Uh -huh. So my first two and a half years were when I was civilian and I was uh, drafted and I continued to enroll in uh, English education. So I was married then uh, to a Vietnamese uh, that when you read the book, uh, Two Minnows, uh, she is number 10 in the family. Nice. So we referred not by name, but we referred to the person by the rank in the family. Yes. So number 10 continued to go to classes and she copied the notes and she sent it to the front line. So my Alice pack, that is the backpack, military backpack, yeah. was full of notes and books. Hmm. And whenever there's a exam, like a term exam, I ask for special permission to come back and take the exam. And so that was uh, almost like online education. Wow, so you were in the army and you're doing your army work, but now your wife's name is Moi, right? Moi, uh, that's number 10. You're right. Moi, number so, 10. so she was sending you notes and other information that you were studying. Yes. So these exams that you did not pass, they were at the beginning of your university career yes, so, I see. yes those were uh, entrance exams you had to entrance exam the passing in order to be admitted right now so you were an officer in the army of the republic of vietnam right the arvin forces yes were you an officer from the beginning or did you have to finish your university training to be an officer 
Well, uh, having passed that uh, baccalaureate, which is the uh, exam at the end of the high school years, so that uh, make us uh, eligible, uh, qualify for officer. Uh, I see. And I have in your book here, I just underlined this. You say that um, I was a lieutenant of the Arvins, that's the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, a member of the Tactical Planning and Training Bureau of Yadzin Province. Is, yes. that, is that right? So we all started with the frontline battlefield and uh, combat. And uh, thanks to me continuing to take classes and passing the years. So I got my bachelor's degree when I was at the front line. I did not attend my oh. graduation. And so that qualified me for, um, so well, after we graduated from boot camp, um, I was um, uh, assigned to uh, armored tanks oh, to be okay. tank commander. Wow. And I requested the transfer to infantry. And uh, uh, we, we have like a national guard here, the local uh, called the regional infantry, regional forces. And so instead of uh, sitting on top of a tank and getting exploded by RPG, mm. it's safer to be an infantry. It's just we had to walk a lot, but mm. uh, avoid uh, buoy traps. Yeah. But that was the better uh, chance for me to stay alive. Wow. So after one year uh, serving in combat, I was allowed to um, refer back to the background that they had in education. So thanks to that bachelor's degree that uh, um, I was uh, assigned to the task of starting um, the, uh, the whole program of training uh, regional forces in maintaining and using the, the uh, weapons that uh, the Americans left after they uh, leave the country. Right. And so it's called the on-site mobile um, training uh, team. So we had teams going from company to company, and these are the companies that uh, are uh, fighting. And then when they come back for uh, resting, then they got uh, a dose of uh, education and training from us. Oh, I see. So you were involved in in training of troops to to um, engage yes. in combat to use the material that the U.S. had left behind. Yes. Yeah. So that is in the province of Jadin, which surrounded Saigon and the Chinatown. Right. So, um, and what year was this? What year were you, did you become an officer in the, in the South Vietnamese Army? I, became, I graduated from boot camp uh, probably mid-1973. Uh, and then uh, 1974, I became that uh, assistant to the director of uh, the uh, training team. So until the end. I see. Yeah. And what was your, your first experience of combat yourself? What's the first memory you have of being in a combat situation? Right from day one, I was uh, assigned to the uh, regional forces. So because we are supposed to deploy wherever there is VC, then there, we are, to, we have to be there. Mm. So um, the VC didn't like uh, regional forces because we know who they are. Mm. We lived in the same local uh, localities uh, where they grew up and we know their family and so do they, they know us. So that is not good either. So mm -hmm. usually like that offensive, the first people who were massacred, there were about 8,000 civilians massacred. 
those are mostly uh, either um, civil servants. If not civil servants, then they are just civilian, but related to the family of the regional forces. And so our family is was at risk. Because you're working with the locals who can tell you what the Viet Cong are doing. Yes. Yeah. So you, you begin, when you begin all American troops, I mean, other than I think Marines at the embassy, maybe a small number of others around, but basically all American troops have left the country. Correct. And one of the, one of the themes you discuss in your book, Two, Min Two Minnows, is this term Vietnamization, the idea of you know, handing the war over to the Vietnamese. The implication being that the United States was fighting the war, but now you know, we're, we're in this process of handing the war to the Vietnamese. Certainly when you put on the uniform of the army of um, the Republic of Vietnam, it was, it was your war. It was the war of South Vietnam against North Vietnam. But, but you, don't, you don't like that term or that concept of Vietnamization. What is it about that that you think is, is a problem? The root of the Vietnamization word tells people that the Americans are now Vietnamizing the war. And that means that they don't do it until the end of the war, January, 1973. So actually we've been fighting since a long time ago, long time, probably even before the Americans got involved in military mm -hmm. and policies. So especially for those, uh, who uh, don't understand much about the war is very misleading. We, like in my case, uh, I started the war when all Americans and allies had gone already. But uh, for me, uh, it, it's just join the war, but the war has been fought back in probably early 1960s, if not end of 1950s. Sure. Right. And you mentioned the Tet Offensive. And obviously, Arvin forces were, I think there are more Arvin forces fighting than there were American forces fighting. Yes. Is, so is, what the, we, we have to imagine that the American forces were deployed everywhere, but they are not really everywhere. Uh, Marines or um, they have bases. But when you look out from the bases, it's not just BC, it's us. It's our Rangers, our airborne, our regional forces. We are everywhere. And that is the reason why we needed 1 million strong. Mm. Whereas I think the American forces at the peak was maybe 500,000, around 500,000 at the peak, yes. I think, of the, yeah. Have you sometimes had the feeling that Americans don't, that the Americans think it was a war of Americans against Vietnamese and don't really even know that, you know, that, that in, the, in South Vietnam, the South, South Vietnam had its own army that the United States was fighting with. Do you think there are a lot of Americans who don't really even know that? Most of them uh, probably never saw the uh, Arvin in action or sometimes uh, only the advisors because uh, the units, the Arvin units were assigned an advisor. So those for sure have seen the Arvin in action. Right. But uh, a soldier, any soldier, the only thing they saw uh, during the time they spent in Vietnam was the, the jungle. 
Yeah. Like my friend, I had a friend who um, um, he's also a principal, high school principal in Wisconsin. He uh, he never been he has never been to Saigon. He and then my brother-in-law who is uh, uh, now in Wisconsin. The only thing he saw was his base, his uh, units, and then out there are the enemy. Mm. And so probably they, many never saw the, the army. And they are same thing with the army, like me when I was growing up. The only news that we uh, receive from the Vietnamese uh, government is just us. <laughs> that we, we were fighting the war. We never saw American movies or news reels showing American soldiers or Australian or uh, South Korean fighting the communists. Yeah. It's only us, Arvin. You were drafted, um, but did what did the war mean to you? Were you defending your country? Were you fighting against communism? What was your motivation? I was uh, completely, probably completely sold that uh, the Americans were there to protect South Vietnam and that communist was bad. Uh, what you see, what you see is really terrifying because massacres of, um, why would you have like my friend i have a pretty close friend who was uh, just sleeping his uh, university students and then uh, one of the same missile landed on his house so people uh, are being bombarded and killed uh, indiscriminately and so um that all for sure will um, burn, add more fuel to your fire. So what you're saying is you, you saw communism as a real threat and the example you give, for example, you didn't mention, you didn't specifically mention the massacre in Way after yes. the head offensive, but that's an example. And you mention in your book that atrocities committed by American troops, most famously or best known My Lai. Yes. That gets a lot of attention, but but there were many more atrocities committed by the communists that, that don't get a lot of attention. Yes. But you were aware of these things at the time, and so you felt like you were protecting your country against this this menace. And you know, this yes. menace came in the form of communism. Did you feel loyal to the government of South Vietnam? Well, probably I have more attachment to that the two um, presidency, mainly because uh, my in-laws uh, on his side. And so uh, one of my brother-in-laws uh, was a uh, secretary uh, in the cabinet. Uh -huh. And then my wife, even my ex-wife, she was a translator for Thiel, a German and English and French. Oh, wow. wow. So we, every weekend we would meet uh, at our house, uh, my mother-in-law's house, the, all the sons and daughters would come. And, and so that's how that we exchange information. And then at that time, I might be <laughs> brainwashed by that. But uh, now when I triangulate information between different sources, I say probably their information is very close. Besides that, my in-laws also have some members who are high ranking officers in the VC government in, in, in the VC uh, uh, command. And so death anniversary is a very important event. So whenever there's a death anniversary of uh, our father, then we get together and there we go. We have the two sides sitting facing each other. Uh, on one side, Thiel's 
on the other side, the, the VCs, and then maybe they change the curses of each other, but we get some information from them too, the, the way they react. So that is that makes the war very difficult for Americans and for the Allies to understand. It's a, the civil war, that's why maybe the Americans call that civil war, but we, we avoid that word, civil war. It's a war between two separate countries. Mm. Now, did you know at the time that there were family members that, that Mai had relatives who were with the Viet Cong? Yes, I, I knew it. Oh, it's so complicated. Yes. Oh, wow. Now, by early 75, it's clear that South Vietnam is not going to, to win the war. And Saigon falls at the end of April 1975. What memories do you have of um, the fall of Saigon? You mentioned the playing of um, that song "White Christmas," which I've heard. I've heard a reference to this before. That that song is playing. Um, what? Why is that song playing? And, and is it playing from white? The song "White Christmas" is playing from loudspeakers in South in in Saigon. It was uh, played on the radio. On wow. the American radio. And the song, six, was, the song was just playing over and over again? Over and over and over. So to alert the um, American and probably the allies that uh, their last chance to leave would be, oh. yes. So that the, the war is ending and then they all have to go to the rendezvous uh, points. So I remember there were about 12 rendezvous points. So one of them, you see that iconic photo of a helicopter picking up refugees. Sure. Yeah. So that must be one of the 12 pickup points for helicopters to evacuate. And do you remember, you remember hearing this on the radio, White Christmas? Yeah. And did you know yeah. at the oh, time what, what that meant? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, number nine, sister number nine uh, was a dentist. She was also a professor in dental school in Saigon. Mm. So she's the one who gave me the information. Why? Because most of her clients were Americans. Oh, okay. And so they are American soldiers, they are American CIA, they're, so wow. they love them and uh, Soldiers, American soldiers love people. Maybe the high command has some problems with our high command, but the little soldiers love, so they want to save us. Mm. And so I have a list of 12 uh, people points and uh, I was able to call my direct uh, supervisor Lieutenant Colonel Pham Cham Kui. And I talked with I was surprised that the line, the line was still not dead yet. So I said, Colonel, yeah, you have to take your family out. Uh, here are the points where you can be evacuated. He said, I can't, Lieutenant. I'm the only high ranking officers in the district of Jadin. And they, they picked up already the, the chief, uh, the chief of staff, and all of the high-ranking uh, uh, officers have been picked up already. So he was the last one. So he has to stay to um, transition the government. Uh, and I'm assuming he went went to a re-education camp. Yes. So. I'm not sure. Uh, by the time I finished uh, my uh, two minerals, I found out that um, his boss, um, Lieutenant Colonel Ngo Chang Phuc, who, who was the chief of staff of the uh, district of Jadin, he was executed by firing squad. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm not sure about Pham Chung Kui. I've been looking for him and I, so far there is no news. Now, this is why, is this why you fled Vietnam? Um, you flee, you become a refugee. Is it because you were an officer in the army of the Republic of Vietnam, but not only that, you had family members um, in the government of South Vietnam. Did you assume that if I stay here, then I'm going to at least spend years in a re-education camp and maybe worse? Yes, you are very correct. So our plan, at least my plan, was not to go to concentration camp. Re-education camp is what the term that they used. Yeah. So our first plan is to escape by boat and find the seventh fleet, the seventh US seventh fleet. Right. We couldn't. So my second plan was to come back and join the resistance. Oh wow. Yeah. And my third one that I never told my ex-wife was to go home and get my grenade and we all die together. Wow. So that was funny that when my mother-in-law, when she was able to come and join us in Wisconsin, she asked me, why, why did you hide that grenade mm. on top of the outhouse? Mm. But you had it there in case you weren't able to get out, you would rather... Yeah. You so luckily, you'd rather die than, than fall into yeah. the hands of the communists. Because uh, um, for sure, my wife, my, my ex-wife, uh, she'll be executed for being the translator for President Till. For the Chu government. Now, when did you actually leave Saigon? Saigon falls on April 30, 1975. Were you in Saigon on that day? I was in Saigon. I was... Uh, um, Tuminos um, uh, tells people that uh, we were looking for a way out on the day of the 30th of April. We, we drove, uh, we, we rode our motorcycle to go again, probe, see if the, there's a good way, safe and good uh, for sure, that we, we would be uh, able to escape. And so we saw lots of uh, looting and lots of um, uh, collaborators. Uh, you, you can't imagine how many collaborators um, are on the street. Uh, maybe they are pretending so that the VC won't pay attention. And sometimes my ex wife and I, we applauded and we hollered, uh, thank you, thank you, comrade, it's just for the sake of avoiding their attention. 30th of April, we were still at home. We waited until the night, and then we took advantage of uh, the VC and the NVA being new to town. Uh, it's size, second is huge for them. We have, they were all looking in the, up at the high rises, and they were, because they never saw high rises before. Mm. So. We took the advantage of them being naive and um, still uh, finding out <laughs> their way in Saigon. So we snuck out of Saigon. Wow. So in Saigon, before, you know, before we get on the boat and leave Vietnam, in Saigon, you saw a lot of looting. You saw people who were helping the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And then you yourself, you, you say in the book and you just said here, you also would pretend if you needed to get through a checkpoint or something, you would pretend that you were glad that the North Vietnamese were in Saigon. Yes. Do, you remember, do you remember hearing the, of course, when Americans think of the fall of Saigon, they think of the helicopters um, coming in, getting people from the American embassy, getting Americans from other places. Do you remember any of that? Do you remember seeing and hearing the helicopters coming and going? Um, these American yes. helicopters wanting to get people out. So at that time, uh, it was before noon. So we were riding our scooter around 
to uh, to check the gate of the embassy to see if there's a way for us to join the climbing <laughs> the, the climbing victims of uh, refugees. Oh right, so you went you went to the embassy, so you were part of yeah. that crowd there at the American embassy trying to get out. But we we did not leave our motorcycle. We just circling around, uh, spy to spy to probe, see if it's uh, feasible um, um, to join the group. But we decided not to, and uh, so that was uh, when um, uh, the uh, the um, interim president of South Vietnam, Big Min. He uh, declared the surrender. And so the looting started. They broke into the, the, the embassy. And um, we did see a couple of uh, Americans, probably Americans because uh, he was crying while riding his scooter, uh, looking for a way into the embassy, but he was too late. He missed the last helicopter. Wow. So after that, we decided to ride our scooter to the Saigon Harbor. And, yes. then, and then from there, we saw no way out. So we rode, we came back home, left the scooter at home, and then rest up a little bit, and then decided to go again to the Saigon Harbor. So that's when we were on the street walking. And now, did you leave from Saigon Harbor or did you go down to the Delta, to the Mekong Delta to, to get the boat out? We actually uh, went to Red Jia, which is the um, um, other point where uh, the, uh, in southern um, uh, of Vietnam. So we found a shrimp boat there. And we looked for more people who would uh, want to join us because uh, the skipper is not going to take just the two people. And so luckily um, we found 60 more wow. to join. And so you get on a shrimp boat and what is your destination? Nowhere. Mm. We were we we are aiming at the uh, navy, the U.S. Navy, the Seventh Fleet, trying to find an aircraft carrier or some American ship yes. out there. But we found no ship; every ship was gone. And then we said, "Oh, that's the, really the end." And so um, the skipper wanted to take us back, and then luckily we found uh, a Thai boat, fishing boat. And during the whole time, a Thai fishing boat has been full of bandits, mm. killing bandits. They've been massacring. So they said that um, at least 30 to 40 percent of the boat people died at sea. Either uh, the boats sink or attacked by the pirates. At the, the pirates from Thailand mainly, huh? But yes. Wow. And so we were very um, um, hesitant when we saw the Thai boat. We were not sure if we were going to be killed or they are going to help us. Wow. And then it was their Buddhist altar. They have a little altar in front of the cabin. And we said, probably being Buddhist, they are not going to kill us. So we took our chance to transfer. To that boat. To that boat. And, and you did get to Thailand. Yeah, so we kept circling around um, the Thai um, skipper was not very sure whether he and his crew would be um, uh, safe to take us because it's like smuggling people illegally and he might be in trouble. 
And so he took us back. So that's what they said. He, he turned around and took us back and told the Vietnamese the shrimp boat behind. And uh, that was uh, to return us to Vietnam so that uh, they don't have to face uh, the Thai government. But we, we, we were thinking about commandeering the boat. And uh, the Thai, the, the Vietnamese skipper cut off the rope and disappeared. And uh, we told the Thai skipper, if uh, you take us to Vietnam, we will all be executed. And yes, they execute. We heard that uh, on the way out. Wow. They execute not just us, but they will also execute all of you. So he changed his mind and took us back to Thailand. Wow. And so you spend some time in Thailand, and then from there you go to Malaysia. Yes. And you, I remember reading in the book that you have interaction with, I think, people who had connections to embassies. And, and then people from the embassies came out and, and talked to you. You're there in, in Malaysia. I think you're living under a tarp, basically. Is that right? You have a tarp and you're living under a tarp. And So that, that didn't happen until Malaysia. Right, yeah. So the Thai government told us to uh, lie. They, they said that you guys all have to go to Singapore because that is where the Seventh Fleet is. They will pick you up. The American Navy, basically. They, yes. So the, the so Thai government told you to go to Singapore to get to pick up the American yes. Navy. Yes. Oh. They are afraid. They, they have a high, high fear of the Vietnamese new government to make their Thailand, the country, Thailand, the next uh, target. Mm -hmm. And so they try to get us out of the Vietnamese refugees. And so we took another Vietnamese uh, boat. This one is bigger, but out of 10 engines, only one or two were still working. Wow. So we just uh, went along the, uh, the coast and then we were stopped by the Malaysian Coast Guard. That's how we ended up you know, on uh, the uh, Malaysian uh, co uh, island of uh, Pulau Perhentian. The tarp was gift from the people of Thailand. Oh, I see. Okay, so in Malaysia, then you put up that tarp and you live under this tarp. And how yes. long are you, are you in? How long are you in Malaysia? You were there probably uh, five or six months. The first five months, we were all exposed to the elements. Thanks to the tarp, then we, we stayed dry. And then we had another piece of tarp uh, as a floor, but we were exposed. We had no roof, no food. The food was uh, uh, spoiled uh, rice. So the, yeah. the reason why I named the book Two Minnows is because we received two dry minnows every day for lunch and for dinner. Mm. And that went with the rice. With the rotten rice. Yeah. And so eventually, you know, word does get to embassies of different countries. I think Canada, Australia, France, United States. You apply, if I remember correctly, you apply for refugee status in France and the United States. I think you're accepted in both. And you, you choose to, to come to the United States. When did you arrive in the United States? I left uh, Vietnam. I left Saigon uh, in the night of uh, April 30th. So five days later, May, probably May 3rd or 4th or 5th, I left Vietnam for good. Mm. And we stayed there until, and, uh, until October. I remember vividly because uh, we celebrated my birthday in October in Minneapolis. 
So it took uh, almost five months. Wow. And you you arrive or you settle in, in Minnesota and get into education and then eventually become a principal of a school. Is that right? Yes. Wow. So um, I continue to go to school. Uh, thanks to the bachelor's degree diploma that I brought from Vietnam, then I got my first job right away, uh, coordinating um, the ESL and bilingual program from Minneapolis. And then I continued to go to school and get my master's degree, my principal's license, and uh, my EDD doctorate in education. Wow. Yeah. When was the first time you went back to Vietnam? So I got married uh, to uh, my second wife, uh, July 15th, 2001. So 2001, we went back. That was my first time going back. Mm. Were you on honeymoon? Yes. For your honeymoon. Did you go to Saigon or Da Nang or where did you go? So I did go to Saigon to visit uh, my brother. And then we went to Hue Hue. to see what uh, was new with Hue because Hue was probably the city that was uh, neglected by the new government. Mm. And uh, indeed it, it was neglected. It was so dusty and mm. everybody was so poor, not like today. Mm. Not like today, yeah. Yeah. Were, were you nervous when you went back to Vietnam for the first time? Yes, when we clear customs. We had to go through customs and they, uh, the guy who checked my passport um, was uh, probably a lieutenant um, or captain of uh, the NVA. Mm. And he looked at me, I looked at him, and probably we were thinking about the same thing. Probably we fought each other during the war. 